All right, everybody, uh, we're going to dive in uh, to week number eight of our verse-by-verse study uh, through the gospel according to John. And uh, before we do that, just want to say to uh, to Haley and to the rest of the team, uh, thanks for y'all's leadership and leading us well. Um, and I know you guys don't see it a lot. I know Grant and I get to see it a lot, uh, just how prayerful she is praying through set lists and uh, for the church months ahead of time. And uh, uh, just wonderful to see God working and moving. And uh, so thanks to her and her leadership and, uh, and our team as well uh, for leading us so, so well. So as I said, we're in week eight uh, of our journey through the gospel according to John. Today we're going to start chapter four, and we're going to cover, brace yourselves, we're going to cover verses one through 26. Hey, yay, let's go. So here's the deal today. Um, we are going to cover uh, the first four-ish verses for the bulk of our time together. And then we're going to cover the last 20-ish verses in about seven minutes, all right? I know what you're thinking. This is an impossibility. But uh, the Lord has led me just in a little bit of a different way today, um, and I think it's going to be impactful. So just just trust me. We'll make it there eventually, and you'll get to lunch at some point. Uh, but uh, as always, if you need to catch up on the series, uh, be sure to hit up our YouTube page. You can find anything there. Uh, and then if you uh, just want to hear it, we're wherever you find your podcast. And uh, uh, maybe you can make our service one of those podcasts as you drive to work or uh, walk around your neighborhood, work out, whatever it is you may be, may be doing. So last week, uh, we covered the story of John the Baptist's disciples, if you remember. If you don't, this is going to be some good catch up because today's... Uh, uh, today's text actually is influenced a lot by last week's text, as usually is the case. But I will spend a little time talking about last week uh, here in just a moment, because it really sets us up for where we're going uh, today, especially in the first four or five verses. Um, so last week, we covered the story of John the Baptist's disciples uh, hearing from a certain Jew, uh, a Jewish person, that, uh, you know what, Jesus' ministry was now a lot bigger than John the Baptist's ministry. Jesus' church was now bigger than John the Baptist Church. And what we discover uh, in between the lines there is this throws John the Baptist's disciples into a panic that now a lot more people are going to Jesus than are coming to them, right? How many of you think that's crazy to hear that people go into a panic because lots of people are going to Jesus? That should be good news, right? But they kind of go into a panic and they fall into this trap of pride and comparison and uh, how that always results in negativity every single single time we compare ourselves or something to someone else, right? They fall into that trap of pride and comparison, and negativity just engulfs them. What once brought them joy now brings them anxiety just because now they're comparing the size of their ministries, right? And so we also studied John the Baptist's response to his disciples, a very healthy and and spiritually mature response on how to deal with pride and comparison. I would encourage you uh, to really check out last week's uh, message, as I know this, all of us struggle with the issue of pride and comparison and jealousy. All of us carry that uh, somehow in some way. All of us somewhere in our lives are insecure, right? All of us are insecure. And here's what I said last week, pride is always birthed out of insecurity. And so pride and comparison will always be a major temptation for us. John the Baptist shows us the very mature and healthy way spiritually to respond to that temptation of pride uh, and, and comparison. And so that's going to play a big part, I think, in the first four verses, really three verses, of where we're going today. We'll dive a little bit more into last week in just a moment. But let me start in chapter four. Uh, we'll start in verses one through three is what I'll read. And uh, this is going to uh, be a little bit of information, important information that John gives us. And then this is going to lead us into a very spicy, uh, scandalous, controversial encounter that Jesus has with a Samaritan woman at a well. Some of you might be familiar of the story of the woman at the well. This is that story that we're going to get to eventually uh, today. So uh, let's start with verse 1. This is long before uh, Jesus moves on towards Samaria. Verse 1, Jesus knew, this is important information, Jesus knew the Pharisees had heard that he was baptizing and making more disciples than John. You ought to be thinking, right? It's the Pharisees who know that Jesus is uh, baptizing and making more disciples than John. Verse 2, this is an important fact we'll talk about in a moment. Though Jesus himself didn't baptize any of them, his disciples did. Verse 3, so he left Judea and returned 
to Galilee. Now, you may be thinking, Pat, what's the big deal about those verses? Hold up, wait, there, there's more. So before we go further into verse 4 and dive into these first three verses, let's go back and read the text from last week because I think this is going to give a lot of depth and richness to verse 1 of chapter 4. Back to chapter 3, verse 22. After this, what does John mean when he says after this? After Jesus cleanses or clears the temple. You guys remember that with the whip? right, with the whip sermon. Uh, he has an encounter with Nicodemus. He introduces this incredible concept that was brand new called being born again. We talked in so much depth about what it means to be born again and how important that is. So after those things, Jesus and his disciples went to the Judean countryside, and he remained there with them, and, he was, and they were baptizing. John, the Baptist, was also baptizing at Anon near Salim because the water was plentiful there, and people were coming and being baptized. This is what we covered a little last week. So here's basically what's happening. Jesus and his disciples are baptizing. John, the Baptist, and his disciples are baptizing in the same area. They're doing the same work in the same area, and let me just put it this way. When two popular ministries of the day doing the same work in the same area, and one of those ministries starts losing their people to the other ministry, how many of you know people are going to get upset? When one church starts really growing because they're taking people from another church, there's going to be some people that are upset, right? This is what happens with John the Baptist's disciples. They get really upset, right? And they start comparing what they're doing versus what Jesus and his disciples are doing. And here's what I know. When people lose one, a lot of people to, to another ministry close in town, right, things can get ugly between those ministries, right? Instead of viewing those people as your teammates, you start to view them as your enemies. And how many of you know it's not a good thing when churches view each other as enemies, right? We're the same team. We wear the same jerseys, right? But, but that's what was happening. They were comparing, and things got ugly. Here's what happened in verse 25 of chapter 3, again from last week. Now, a discussion or a healthy debate arose between some of John's disciples and a Jew over purification. So they were having this conversation. And somewhere in between verse 25 and 26, this Jewish person who is unnamed that we don't know obviously lets John the Baptist's disciples know, hey, Jesus' church is bigger than your church now, right? He lets him know that. And, and what, what's the result of them getting that news? Verse 26 of chapter 3. And they, John the Baptist's disciples, go to John the Baptist and say to him, Rabbi, he who is with you across the Jordan to whom you bore witness, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world, talking about Jesus, he is baptizing, and everybody is going to him. Everybody's going to him. Nobody's coming to us you can kind of see the issue here of what's happening. That's what we covered last week. But notice what it says here in verse 25. It says, a certain Jew had a conversation, a debate over purification, and a certain Jew was the one that told them that Jesus' church was bigger than their church now. Now, think about that. Keep that in your mind. Now let's go to chapter 4, verse 1. Jesus knew the Pharisees were the ones that had heard he was baptizing and making more disciples than John. So let me ask you this question. Who do you think the Jewish person was that told John the Baptist's disciples that Jesus was baptizing more people than them? It was a Pharisee, right? Yeah, that's who it was, right? The Pharisees were the ones that heard that G Jesus was baptizing more than John the Baptist and his disciples, right? So it was these Pharisees, and Jesus knew it, right? He told John the Baptist's disciples, hey, you guys used to be the place to go. You guys used to be the happening ministry in town. And I don't know if you've noticed, but now Jesus' church is bigger. And this guy just kind of stirs the pot between Jesus' ministry and John the Baptist's ministry. He stirs the pot, this Pharisee, to create some division and some trouble between John the Baptist and Jesus. Now, here's a question we have to ask. Why in the world... Would a Pharisee stir up trouble and division between John the Baptist and Jesus' ministry? Here's why I think. I think the Pharisees probably don't like what Jesus is doing. I think the Pharisees don't like that John the Baptist correctly prophesied, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. They don't like this. And so what is the best way to destroy something good? Stir up a little division from the inside out. And this is what this Pharisee does. And it works. And it gets John the Baptist's disciples all riled up and worried that Jesus is now baptizing more people than them. 
And so what John, the writer of the Gospel John, points out to us in chapter 4, Jesus knew who it was that was doing this, and because he knew who it was, listen, John the Baptist also points out something very, very important. John the Baptist's disciples were saying, hey, Jesus is stealing all of our thunder. But what does John, the writer of the gospel, let us know? That Jesus wasn't the one that was even baptizing people. Right? He wasn't physically doing any of the baptizing. It was his disciples. This is a critical, critical point for me to point out and for John to point out in his gospel. And let me tell you why it's very important. Because we just got done talking about the dangers of pride in comparison. Now let me ask you to use your imagination a little today. Use our minds a little bit. Transport yourself back to the first century, if you would. Pretend you are there in that place, right? And uh, Jesus is on the scene, and John the Baptist is on the scene. Now, let's say for argument's sake and us using our imaginations, let's pretend that Jesus is actually baptizing people. And let's say that you were one of the ones that was actually baptized by Jesus himself. How many of you would just by a show of hands would say it would be incredible to be baptized by Jesus himself, right? All of us would, right? That would be a badge of honor. Now, here's what I know about me and probably about you and humanity, right? If we were baptized by Jesus, we would find some way, somehow, well, not you, you're holy. Let's, let's use second service as the, as the example, right? You're holy people. The second service people... You know what, they would, they would find a way to brag about that Jesus was the one that, that uh, baptized them, right? If you were baptized, by, you would find a way to play that card, wouldn't you? You'd find a way, second service would find a way. And then let's say you were sitting in a Starbucks in the first century, and you were having some Turkish coffee and a falafel there in the Starbucks in the first century, right? And your buddy comes up to you and says, man, you're never going to believe what's happened to me. I have repented. I have turned from my wicked ways. I was baptized by John the Baptist. I had a baptism of repentance. John the Baptist baptized me. And you're sitting there sipping your Turkish coffee, and you begin to scoff at his baptism. <laughs> you got baptized by John the Baptist. I got baptized by Jesus the Christ, right? <laughs> Ever heard of him, right? We would leverage who baptized us to make ourselves feel more important and better than the other person. Again, not you. Second service people would do that in the first century. That's pride. That's comparison. I think the reality of humanity is this. We will use anything, and for followers of Jesus, we'll even use our beliefs, our interpretations of Scripture, and our theology to exalt ourselves above others and make ourselves seem more superior than they are. Right? Just to make ourselves feel better. And that is pride. It's gross and it's ugly. But that's what we do, right? As human beings, that's what we do. We would find a way, I would find a way to play the Jesus baptized me card. I would find a way to work it in because I'm just a broken person that is prideful and, and sinful. This is what humanity does. And this was an actual issue in one of the early churches that Paul had to write a letter to because these people were just stubborn, right? And they were prideful. 1 Corinthians was written because there was a lot of pride and comparison going on. This issue of who baptized who became a point of contention amongst the believers in the church at Corinth. Listen to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. I'll start in verse 10. And you know if he starts off with the problem at the beginning of the letter, <laughs> you got issues in that church. This is what he says. I appeal to you, Paul says, dear brothers and sisters, by the authority of our Lord Jesus Christ, to live in harmony with each other. Let there be no divisions in the church, but rather be of one mind, united in thought and purpose. For some members of Chloe's household have told me about your quarrels, my dear brothers and sisters. Some of you are saying, I am a follower of Paul. Others are saying, I follow Apollos, or I follow Peter. Some say, I follow only Christ. Verse 13, has Christ been divided into factions? Was I, Paul, crucified for you? Were any of you baptized into the name of Paul? Of course not, because I love this. Paul says, I thank God I didn't baptize any of you. <laughs> it's hilarious. <laughs> Except Crispus and Gaius, for no one can say they were baptized in my name. And then he remembers something as he's writing. It just cracks me up. Oh, yes, I also baptized the household of Stephanus, but I don't remember baptizing anybody else. 
Christ didn't send me to baptize, but to preach the good news, not with clever speech, for fear of the cross of Christ would lose its power. And so the issue at hand at what's happening here, they were comparing who baptized them to determine who was better, who was more holy, and who was more prominent in the church. They were dividing over preacher personalities. Some people followed only Paul because they like, he told it like it was. Some followed Apollos because he was very eloquent with his speech. Some only followed Peter because he was the blue-collar guy that got it wrong but, but always had a good way of saying the right thing. And, then, and this is wild to me. Here was an option. Some people actually followed Christ. There were divisions in this church to the point where following Jesus was just an option amongst others. And for Christians, let me just say this. If following Jesus is an option and not the option, you got issues in your church and you need a letter from the Apostle Paul. This is what was happening in the church. And I think this is why John points out in his gospel, Jesus didn't actually baptize anybody. They were getting all wound up because Jesus was doing a bigger work than them. But what does John tell us? Jesus didn't actually baptize anybody. I think Jesus was wise in recusing himself from baptizing people because Jesus knows the hearts of human beings and how prone to pride and comparison we really are. And if you think about it in the Corinthian church, the only thing that came from comparing who baptized who was division. And if you want to tear something down that's going really good, divide it from the inside out. As I said last week, the moment we compare ourselves to somebody else, somebody always loses. And if somebody loses in the relationship, nobody wins. The moment they started comparing in this Corinthian church, they lost sight of Christ's work. And it caused them to see their teammates as their enemies. That is division. And here's one thing I know. Christ's kingdom is not a kingdom of division. It is a kingdom that should be united. This is what Jesus is after. Comparison only gives birth to division. And here's what I know. With all the craziness in our world, with an election season just weeks away, now more than ever, please hear this today, a divided world needs a united church. It needs it. In Mark 3, Jesus would say, a kingdom divided by civil war will collapse. Similarly, a family splintered by feuding will fall apart. What is Jesus saying? Division always breaks things down, but it is only unity that will build things up. I think this is why John lets us know Jesus didn't physically baptize anybody. Because Jesus knows the hearts of people. And he also knows this fact. Verse 1, Jesus knew the Pharisees had heard. They just heard it. They didn't see it, that Jesus was baptizing and making more disciples than John. And then John gives us the reality of the truth. Jesus himself didn't baptize anybody. His disciples did. Jesus knew the Pharisees wanted to mess up his work and bring division. They were pitting John the Baptist against Jesus. They were pitting them against one another because they did not want the work to succeed, to succeed. And because Jesus knew the Pharisees' hearts were set on division and negativity, this is beautiful. Do you know what Jesus did to prevent division between John the Baptist and himself? Do you know what Jesus did? Listen, Jesus knew the Pharisees heard he was baptizing and making more disciples, though he didn't baptize anybody. Verse 3, so he what? He's left. That is unheard of. He just left. He left the area, goes back to the region of Galilee. He lets John the Baptist and his disciples have the ministry, even though his ministry was more successful. That is incredible. And that is unheard of. And if you think about it, though, with the Pharisees breeding negativity and division to John the Baptist's disciples, and with it being so early in Jesus' ministry, Jesus does the wise and mature thing and just removes himself from what could be a potentially toxic and divisive situation. It was the only way to peace. It reminds me of a verse the Apostle Paul writes in the book of Romans, verse 18 of chapter 12. He says, if it is possible, as far as it depends on who? 
you, not them. As far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. I think this verse is telling us peace doesn't begin with the other person finally doing what you want them to do. If you're waiting on that, you're going to be waiting a long time. Peace doesn't begin by getting the apology you've always wanted. Peace doesn't begin with them. This verse tells us peace begins with who? It begins with me. Peace begins with me, and it begins with you. And from what we see Jesus doing here, leaving the area, you know what it tells me? Sometimes to keep peace and to be at peace in certain situations that are potentially toxic and divisive, the most peaceful thing we can do is remove ourselves from the situation. That's it. Now, I'm not telling you not to try. I'm not giving you an excuse today. When things get difficult, you just exit and leave. That is not what I'm saying at all. Please be more mature about this. I'm just saying after we work our tails off for peace and we have exhausted all of the options and things are still unhealthy, sometimes distance is the only way to peace. Sometimes that's just the way it is. What do I mean by distance? I mean sometimes take a step back. Count to ten. Maybe freeze the relationship for a little bit. Choose to remain quiet if blowing up is the only result when you communicate. Distance. And I'm just announcing this today in view of this truth. I'm stepping back and taking a leave from Auburn football because I need some peace in the name of Jesus. (laughs) Yeah, God hears what you're saying now, so tread carefully. Sometimes distance is the only way to peace. In all seriousness, when you are suffocating in a situation, it is okay to give yourself the permission to create space to breathe. Listen, if physically, if oxygen is necessary physically for our bodies to be healthy and thrive, if a situation is suffocating us emotionally and spiritually, we need some oxygen. We need to create some space to breathe. And sometimes I know Distance is the only way to peace. Think about when we studied through the book of Jonah, verse by verse. There were some sailors. Jonah had kind of stowed away on their boat. And these sailors were just living their lives, right? Carrying Jonah, carrying their stuff. They knew nothing. And all of a sudden, they found themselves in a storm. Was the storm their fault? No, it was Jonah's fault. But they were in the storm. And their ship was their livelihood. Everything in that ship was valuable to them. And what was happening? It was all breaking apart because of the storm. And what did they try to do? They tried everything within their range to get the storm to stop and to keep the ship afloat. They threw everything overboard. Their livelihood, they threw it overboard. Their ship was starting to break apart. And then finally, what was their last option? To create some space and have a little peace, what did they have to do? Throw Jonah overboard. And the moment they created some space, what happened? The storm ceased. They found peace. And by their step of faith, what happened? It actually put Jonah in a place where God could actually get to him too. As much as the distance and space would be good for your peace, it also might be the thing that God works through to reach the other person. Nothing else is working, sometimes distance. So do what is required for peace. Now, again, I am not suggesting that somebody you have an issue with, you invite them out on the lake today to a boat and you throw them overboard, okay? (laughs) This is metaphor. Is everybody with me? Okay, this is metaphor. Work your tail off for peace. Do the work of peace. But sometimes we just might need some space. Jesus, in this instance, left the region of Judea to go back to Galilee, to let things breathe for a little bit. He knew the Pharisees' hearts, so he created some space so he could continue his work, John could continue his work. The kingdom could move forward. And if Jesus maybe had stayed where he was, he may have missed what was next. Jesus leaves the region of Judea to go back to Galilee where he was from, but he was very strategic when he left. Jesus chose to travel Uh, from Judea to Galilee, and he chose a certain route to go through. John lets us know this very interesting fact, and this is going to get us towards his encounter with the woman at the well. So he left Judea, returned to Galilee, verse 4. He had to go through Samaria. 
It's an interesting phrase. He had to go through Samaria on the way back to Galilee. Put that map up if you would, Jonathan. So I know this might be kind of hard for us to see for some of us more vintage people with more vintage eyes, but uh, just trust me by color here. So you see Jerusalem at the bottom there, uh, that, that region of Judea, kind of where Jesus was. Kind of the shortest route back up to Galilee at the top there. You can see Nazareth there. Uh, it's just straight through, right? It's just a straight line through, and that traveled through the area of Samaria. But most God-fearing Jews would choose to not travel through Samaria. I'll tell you why in just a moment. They would choose one of two other routes, right? Let's say Jerusalem to Galilee took three days. Usually it did. To go around that way, you see the red dotted line there, to go around that way would add four whole days to your trip. How many of you, when you put it in your GPS, you want the shortest, fastest route to get to where you're going? All of us do. They would take four extra days just to not have to travel through Samaria. Or they would go the way of the coast. You see kind of the green line that's really kind of difficult to see. They would add an extra three or so days to their trip, right? And so when John says Jesus had to go through Samaria to get to Galilee, I just have to say this. No, he didn't. <laughs> like, he had two other options that most Jews actually traveled to get there. So why is that statement so significant? Most Jews would travel around. They would pay the extra dollars and take the extra time, right? Because Samaria contained a people that a lot of Jewish people did not like called Samaritans. And the reason they would never step foot in Samaria was because of Samaritans. There was a major beef, some bad blood between Jews and Samaritans. Jews viewed, it, viewed Samaritans as sellouts, half-breeds, unclean and defiled, they argued with Samaritans over the place to worship. Samaritans worshiped God on the mountain, Mount Gerizim. The Jews worshiped God at the temple where they believed the fullness of the presence of God was. And so there's this constant fighting over it. The Jews called Samaritans, as I said, half-breeds because they intermarried long ago when Israel was overtaken by the Assyrian Empire. And that history has never been forgotten. For over 700 years, you guys, there has been a beef between these two peoples. Jews wouldn't set foot in Samaria, and Samaritans were glad these snobby hypocrites stayed out of their country. There was some major, major beef between them. So what does Jesus do? Jesus, a God-fearing Jew, does something that most God-fearing Jews would not do. He walks right into the heart of Samaria, and by doing so, makes a profound statement to them and to the world about what his kingdom is really all about. We learn this about Jesus by him traveling into the heart of Samaria. Here's what we learn. Jesus never created lines to keep people out. He always crossed lines to bring people in. Isn't that beautiful? That's who Jesus is. Think about what we know about Jesus from the gospel accounts of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We know Jesus goes into Samaria. Jesus eats in the home of tax collectors. That may not sound like a big deal to you, but Jews hated tax collectors because tax collectors were Jews who worked for the Roman empires and took from their very own people and sometimes would cheat them. Jesus ate with those people, had relationship with those people who were hated. Jesus hung out with sinners and was given a title that was supposed to be derogatory but is actually very encouraging. Jesus was known as the friend of what? Sinners, the friend of sinners. That's encouraging to a sinner like me, Amen. You shouldn't amen and judge me like that, but I am a sinner. I'll give you that. Jesus, we know, never created lines to keep people out. He crossed them to bring people in. Jesus was bringing his kingdom to all peoples. And I want you to notice something very, very particular about the wording and specific about the wording in John chapter 3 and John chapter 4, I'll point out. It says this, Jesus went to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and then by his death, it provides access to the ends of the earth. Does that make sense? It says in chapter 3 and 4, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and his death provided a way to reach the ends of the earth. And if you think about it, when he goes into those places, what does Jesus do? He demonstrates what the kingdom of God is about and who the kingdom is for. So that's where he goes, Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria. If you remember back to our verse-by-verse -verse study of Acts, Chapter 1, verse 8, listen to this promise that Jesus gives to his followers. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and even to the ends of the earth. What do we see? Please listen. We see Jesus modeling 
the very ministry now that he has given to us. He's modeled it. He demonstrates what the kingdom is about and who the kingdom is for. And now he has handed us that ministry. And here's what I have to say. What Jesus models, Jesus meant. What Jesus modeled, he meant. He was serious about making it on earth as it is in heaven. Jesus modeled this ministry, right? He's serious about making it on earth as it is in heaven. So how in the world do we follow what Jesus has done, and how do we make it on earth as it is in heaven? This is going to sound redundant, but you know this already. John chapter 13, verses 34 and 35. So now Jesus says, I'm giving you a new commandment. Love each other. Just as I have loved you, you should love each other, and your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. Jesus is serious about making it on earth as it is in heaven. So serious, he goes to a place that many Jews considered defiled, Samaria. He's so serious about it, he goes to a people that they considered defiled, Samaritans. But then he's really serious about making it on earth as it is in heaven. That He has a conversation, not just with a Samaritan, get this, a Samaritan woman, a gender that was considered to have no value, worth, or privilege in the first century. And I'm going to spoil it out here, out here all already and let you know this Samaritan woman with no worth and value and privilege was the first person human being outside of the realm of the disciples where Jesus reveals himself as the Messiah that is a statement that is a statement Jesus had to go through Samaria so he can have a conversation with one insignificant Samaritan woman this was shocking and scandalous let me read you what the disciples thought after the conversation, which we'll get into next week. Verse 27 of chapter 4. Just then, after Jesus finishes the conversation, his disciples come back. They were shocked to find him talking to a woman, but none of them had the nerve to ask, what do you want with her? Why are you talking to her? Can you feel that tension there? Jesus is making a statement. Church, it's one thing to love people who are like you and think like you and look like you and vote like you and believe like you and are pro this and pro that just like you, but how many of you know it's another thing to reach out and embrace and love people who aren't like you, who don't look like you, who don't think or believe like you, who aren't conservative, who maybe don't vote like you, who see the world differently and even might consider themselves oriented differently than you? It's harder to love those kinds of people, isn't it? But let me say this. Just because it's harder to love people who are different doesn't mean it's a valid excuse to not do it. Jesus' commands are not based on our convenience and our comfort. They are a command from our Lord. And he says in John 14, 15, if you love me, this is Jesus talking, obey my commandments what are his commandments summed up into john chapter 13 verses 34 and 35 so now i'm giving you a new commandment love each other just as i have loved you you should love each other and it will prove to the world that you are my disciples so logically follow me if our love for jesus is shown through obedience to his commands and he gives us the one command to love others the way he has loved us, then I think we can rightly say that we love and honor Jesus the most when we love each other the way that he has loved us. Self-giving, co-suffering, radically forgiving. This is what Jesus was serious about. This is how to make it on earth as it is in heaven. And if Jesus is serious about this, how many of you think his church ought to be serious about it too? We need to be about this business that Jesus was about. Before we get to the last uh, 22 verses that we're going to cover in about six and a half minutes in just a moment, in this vein, I was asked on Wednesday afternoon, uh, our students uh, that this, this past Wednesday night had like a panel where they did a Q&A, and kids wrote down questions on note cards that our leaders got, and I got asked on Wednesday afternoon to sit in on a Wednesday night, and they gave me the really fun question that they didn't want to answer, but they gave it to me, which I was fine to answer. And the question was this. How do you handle, deal with, or relate and witness to a person who is a homosexual? Easy, right? Obviously, 
we, we disagree with that lifestyle, of course. But I just gave a couple of answers. My first was this. Treat them like a human being because they are a human being. Like that's first and foremost. And then I began to answer their question with a question. And I'm going to ask you this question too. Who's the only one that can renew, restore, and redeem a person's life? Yes, very good, Jesus. Jesus, the only one. We can't, only he can. And so if Jesus is the only one who can redeem, renew, restore, heal, and transform a life, if he's the only one that can do it, then our number one priority has to be this. We need to get people to Jesus. Are you with me? We need to get them there. Listen, I told the students, our job is not to change people. Using this example, I said, when you encounter a homosexual, your goal shouldn't be to make them unhomosexual. That's not your job. It's not who you are. You can't. And if that's our goal, to try to make them exactly how we want them to be, that's not our job. Our job is just to get them to Jesus. And if we want to get people to Jesus a little faster than the church normally has done it before, this is what I told them. The best way to engage people about Jesus, don't start with how bad they are. Start with how good Jesus is. That's how you need to start. And I found talking about how good Jesus is and meeting people where they are without trying to change them all at once has opened the door to more healthy conversation than anything else. It is the wildest thing that loving people the way Jesus loved me works. Jesus ate dinner with tax collectors probably before he ever called them to change. He built a relationship. Are you with me? Love opens the door. Hatred and judgment closes it. Jesus' goal in going to Samaria and talking with a Samaritan woman was not to make her unsamaritan. It was to show her she was valued and that she had worth. That's the only reason he went. And he went to give her something she desperately needed, living water. And I thought these next six and a half minutes could say and show you what living water is better than me in 30 more minutes could do it. So we'll love and thank your preacher today. We're going to close uh, today. This is Jesus with the woman at the well. Ooh, it's my eighth time and I'm still struggling to see that. He came just for her. Just for her. A mess up. Seemingly insignificant, nobody in the scope of eternity. But Jesus came just for her. And it's beautiful. And I wanted you to see that today. I, th I think that's how Jesus was. He truly loved people. He didn't have to get it all together. He just had to get to him. And can I tell you the beauty of this story? This Samaritan woman didn't even get to him. He got to her. He came to her. Let me ask you this question today. Hearing what we've heard, not the messed up view that sometimes the church can give us of Jesus but like the real Jesus, the Jesus of the woman at the well, the Jesus that eats in the home of tax collectors, the Jesus that is the friend of sinners, the Jesus that loves the way that he loves. Can I ask you this question? Do you think that that Jesus is trustworthy? If he was looking at you in the face today and he asked you this question, as you are today, not about you, but it's about him. And he said, do you think I'm trustworthy? Based on what we've heard and seen, how would you answer that question? Do you think he's trustworthy? And if your answer is yes, why not trust him today? Why not take a step towards him? Why not take a step of faith? and follow him. 
the way that we go ultimately just leads to our end. Our own selfishness, our own greed, our own pride, our own comparison just causes us to fall time after time after time. And Jesus shows us this more beautiful way. And he invites us into it. And to get there, we don't have to read books. We don't have to attend classes. We don't even have to clean up. He just says, come to me, all who are weary and carry heavy burdens. He says, I will give you rest. His way is light and easy because it gives life to those who trust him. And I'll just ask, do you trust him today? Is he trustworthy? Why not take a step towards him? I want to ask you just to bow your heads and close your eyes right where you are. Today, he offers living water right where we are. And if you've gone your own way, you've drank from your own well, and today you realize there's a better way. There's a better source for life and hope and peace. And that way is the way of Jesus. Jesus has shown us with the beautiful life that he lived, how to truly be a better human being, how to love. Then he demonstrated that love when they put him on a cross. And on the cross, the sin of the world was put on to Jesus, the sin of the world. And as the sin of the world was put on to Jesus and Jesus dies on the cross, sin was dealt with once and for all, once and for all. He doesn't give out punishment, he gives out pardon. And then when he rose from the dead, he conquered even death. And now the power of sin and death no longer have the final word. Our good, loving, kind Jesus has the final word. And what is he speaking today? Life, hope, peace, a better way. And so today, maybe for the first time, you need to take a step towards him. Scripture would just tell us that if we believe, we believe that he came and he died and he rose from the dead and we confess him as Lord, confess him as Lord, that means we confess that his way is supreme above any other. It's the better way that we would be saved. Not about what we do, it's about trusting in what's already done. If that's a decision you need to make, right where you are, confess your belief and confess Jesus as Lord. Right where you are, make that decision today. Confess him. Confess him as Lord. You will be saved. And for all of us who may have wondered today in view of that mercy, what should be our response to the goodness of our God? That we offer ourselves as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to Him. What does that look like to trust Him? Trusting Jesus always looks like following His better way. And if we've been following another way other than His, here's what we need to do today. Repent. A change of mind with a change of direction. Let's follow the better way. What's the better way look like? It looks like loving others the way he loved us. Self-giving, co-suffering, radically forgiving. Right where you are, repent, commit to that better way. Would you take a moment and repent before God today? Change of mind with a change of direction. Jesus, thank you for being who you are, for meeting this woman in the middle of the day, in a place that nobody else was willing to go. You went there and demonstrated what your kingdom is about and who it's for. 
It's for everyone. The people who are messes, the people who are rejected, the people who don't have it all together, and even though for those who think they have it all together but really don't. You are for us and not against us. Thank you for your kindness. And I'm grateful that can lead us to repentance, to a better way. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for this beautiful story today. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Everybody said amen.